Welcome back to D20 Tactics. On this channel, I play Dungeons and Dragons with my friends. We explore combat scenarios and play out the tactics used to defeat monsters quickly and safely, giving you more time to get back to roleplaying. I'm your host and dungeon master, Sarsen Zero, and this week we have a recap of a dungeon recently completed by Azure Wolf, Blind Oracle, Fear No Equal, and Merrick of War. First, I'll replay the six encounters of the Demonic Incursion, and then we'll talk about the encounters that we thought deserved more commentary. If you recently watched those encounters, I'll put a timestamp for the start of the discussion in the description below. All of our heroes made it home after this one, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. The adventurers have tracked down a demonic cult that had immediately fled upon their discovery. The adventurers are racing across the wasteland, pursuing the cult before they get to their final destination, whatever that might be, and do whatever it is that they're trying to do. As the adventurers make landing on the back of the abyssal contraption that is hurtling through the waist on a pair of very machine-like treads. They make it to the landing on the back door. In preparation for this fight, is anybody pre-casting any spells? I am actually. I'm knocking back a potion of fire resistance. That sounds good. Rogue, are you pre-casting any spells? We're going to pre-cast fly off the band door. Sounds good, because Fly has a duration in excess of one minute. You can cast it and have it ready for the first encounter. Wizard, are you pre-casting any spells? I'm going to ritual cast my fine familiar to get old Alistair Crowley out here. Cast the Simulacrum spell ahead of time. Going to put Mage Armor on me. Hand him a scroll, and he's going to cast a scroll on himself. I think that's it. Cleric, are you pre-casting any spells? Hero's Feast, that'll be... Seven. Which 12 creatures are going to consume this feast? I believe that would be the entire party at this point. You're offering this to the cleric, wizard, rogue, and fighter. Don't forget the owl. <laughs> <laughs> if I can include the familiar, I will. It's kind of surprises me it took you guys this long to figure it out. But yeah, I don't see any reason an owl can't consume a hero's feast. Simulacrum can't gain HP. There's more than just HP to gain. It seems to me that it would also be able to become immune to poison, be cured of all diseases and poisons, become immune to frighten and advantage on wisdom saves. Aid at a level four. Plus 15 hit points, to which three people are getting the aid bonus. Fighter, rogue, the wizard. Hit points, ability, speed. Spells, items in hand. 202 of 202. A great axe plus two in hand. Action surge, second wind, both indomitables, all available. I'm at 122 out of 122 hit points. Wand of the War Mage plus two in hand. Spellbook in the other hand. Arcane Recovery up for first level. Three second, three third, three fourth, two fifth, one sixth, and one eighth. The Simulacrum has 50 HP. Out of 50. We are holding a plus two short bow in hand using plus one arrows. A hundred and sixty nine HP after Heroes Feast and Aid. And I have sneak dice all day on tap. Let's go. Two Channel Divinities, a Warhammer with a plus two shield. Four level ones, three level two, three level three, two level fours, two level five. A level 7, and a level 8. I have 170 hit points out of 170. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This encounter is a six-armed snake demon. Snake demon is a demon, as one might imagine. They have demonic resistances. True sight for 120 feet. Sorry, rogue. They have some resistances to magic. They have an ability called reactive, where they can take one reaction per turn of combat. Multi-attack, as you might imagine, a six-armed creature can do. They also have a tail attack that can grapple and restrain people. And they have the ability to teleport. They can also parry with those swords as one of their many, many reactions terrain and effects. A lot going on in this fight. So you guys are on top of an abyssal engine that's hurtling through the waste. If you end your turn on a yellow square, you will move backward towards the rear of the engine 10 squares, 50 feet at the end of your turn as the waste underneath you go hurtling past. If that movement pushes you under the engine, then you will take 10d6 bludgeoning damage. The Orin section, if you land on the tracks, well, you can actually run across the top of the tracks, but you have to balance yourself there with a DC 17 acrobatics check. If you fail this, you will fall prone, and there's a bunch of spikes on the tracks as well, so you're gonna take 6d6 slashing damage. And then finally, there's some red areas as well, which are just 
immediately dangerous. In the corners of the engine, there's a couple of flaming skulls. We'll do 66 fire damage. Then there's the engine compartment. Should you fall into the engine compartment, you will take a total of 66 fire damage as the flames of the abyss burn at you, 66 bludgeoning damage as the engine's gears grind against you, and just for fun, 66 psychic damage as the souls that power the engine scream into your mind. That's what we're looking at for terrain. Any questions? How long have you been waiting to use this? I just found it yesterday, to be honest. I've had it for a while, but I was just flipping through them and going, oh, this looks cool. It is fine if we're over the engine, but not falling in the engine. Yeah, yeah. if you try to stand in the engine, you're going to take a whole bunch of damage. If you fly over it, that's fine. Winged boots. This is the part where we need to have a brief conversation about true sight versus hiding. True sight means I can't be invisible. However, if I do find something or someone to hide behind, I'm still stealth. 100% 100% true. Yep. They have a passive perception of 13, a maximum perception of 23, which means your minimum is above their maximum. They can never spot you unless you're using something like invisibility to hide. It's the ability to see through illusions, not the ability to see the people who are just plain hidden. Tactics in this fight. What do you guys think for tactics in this fight? We gotta burst this thing down, obviously, because it's the only enemy, but like really cut loose on it because that's a lot of attacks that it can get to throw at us if we give it more turns than we should. Agreed. Seems reasonable. In terms of getting to it, I think I'm probably the only one who really needs to be in melee contact, so I can just go wherever because I can fly over the engine. It's going to teleport into you guys, though, because it really wants to lay on to the simulacrum with six attacks. Let's do the thing. All right, let's do the thing, then. Go ahead and roll initiative. Yeah. Tip from a 7 into a 15. Jelly. I love my high initiative that I didn't used to have. Anybody beat a 20? I have a 20. Anyone have between a 20 and a 15? 18 on the fighter. Anyone got between a 15 and a 10? 15 for the wizard. 13 for the cleric. 10 for the rogue. It looks like I'm missing a owl. 10 on the owl. We're going to start off with Mary, the snake demon. Mary has a 40-foot move. She doesn't have a fly speed, and she can't fly over that. She can't jump it. She's going to back up through this door and then ready a teleport when the wizard goes. That's me. After the snake demon, we're going to go to the fighter. Can these doors be closed? Can she teleport to a location she can't see? Well, she could teleport out of the room if she could see out of the room somehow, yeah. Advance across the room to the spot just south of the door that's going to require a dash after the fighter we go to the wizard honestly i kind of want to shut the door lock me in with the snake do it pretty much i kind of just want to move forward and shut the door <laughs> object interaction to shut the door what's your action i ready chain lightning to shoot it when i see it sounds good my ready to action was after the wizard goes and i perceive the wizard going so after that happens i'm going to teleport the simulacrum will also ready chain lightning to shoot it when he sees it move up north one after the wizard is the cleric and this door is closed currently I'd like to open the door to walk through it and get into the arena. You open the door, that's your object interaction. As soon as you're done with that, Wizard and the Simulacrum can see it, which will trigger their readied actions. Go ahead and give me those. Dex DC 18. I have Magic Resistance, which gives me advantage on spell effects. 18 for the first one. 61. It dodged the chain lightning, so that will reduce it down to 30. It resists lightning, so that will reduce it down to 15. It takes 15 points of lightning damage. But you're on the board, so that's fun. Simulacrum's going to do the same thing. I'm going to get the exact same roll, 18 to dodge. 55 with the plus 5. That'll be half 27 as I dodge it, halved again to 13 as I resist it. Wanted to essentially start walking down towards it. I would like to cast Spiritual Weapon. If I had a hammer. Hammer on the first encounter. Hammer in the second encounter. That'll be a natural 20. That'll hit. That'll be 12. That's your bonus action. Do you have an action action? And it's really a war hammer strike if it gets close enough to hit. After that, we're going to go to the rogue. All right, let's start this game up. Bonus action height. 31. Move up. Object interaction to prop the door open. Take the shot. 18. 18 is what you need. 43. Then I'd like to scurry back behind the doorway. That's my turn. After the rogue, we go to the owl. Gonna move in and get advantage to the fighter, please. After the owl, we go to Mary, the snake demon. Mary's gonna start off with her tail attack. 26 to hit you, fighter. That will do. 12 points of bludgeoning damage. If you are medium-sized or smaller, and you are, then you are grappled with a DC 19. Until this grapple ends, you are restrained. She's now going to make her longsword attacks on you. 19. Miss. 17 to hit. Miss. The 20 should hit. Hit. 20 points of slashing damage. 24 to hit you. Hit. 9 slashing. 
22 to hit you. Hit 15 slashing. 23 to hit you. That'll hit. 15 slashing. Whatever, I'm still in triple digits. She's going to move to here, and she's going to drag you with her. After that, we're going to go to the fighter. In order to ungrapple, I have to make uh, athletics action. So you can make a acrobatics or athletics to hit a DC 19 as your action. Alternatively, grapple ends if the target is unconscious, incapacitated, or it is more than its reach away from you. I do not have disadvantage for being grappled, so let's just wail on it. You don't have disadvantage for being grappled, but you do have disadvantage for being restrained. Yeah, so I need to break that. So yeah, let's go ahead and take the action to break the grapple. 19 on the nose. 19 will do it. That's your action. What else you got? For starters, I have an action surge. First attack is with advantage because Owl. 22 to hit. It will bring up one of its swords to use its parry reaction, increasing its AC to 23, blocking the attack. All right, second attack. That's going to miss. That's a 13. 25 to hit. Hits. For 17 damage. Move me west two spaces. After the fighter, we go to the wizard. Do the same thing. Object interaction, shut the door, ready magic missile for when I see the thing. Same for the simulacrum. Let's go fifth to just kind of burn it. Fifth for both of them, right? Correct. After the wizard, we're going to the cleric. I'd like to move and dash up to the other side of the door. Bonus action, get the spiritual weapon next to the uh, demon. 21. Demon is going to use another one of its reactions to parry this melee attack with one of its swords. Sounds good. That'll be it. The rogue. Well, the door being shut is a bit of a problem. Bonus action hide to start. 25. 25 will do it. Object interaction costs me nothing for the first one. Yep. Let's go 7 on the diagonal, provided I can see Mary the snake demon. At some point in that line, you'll be able to see her. And then take the shot. Halfling luck triggers. 29 to hit. 29 will hit, even with a cover. For 45 points of damage. I'd like to tuck around the corner, and that is my turn. After the rogue, we go to the owl. Swoop in. Same thing, get the fighter advantage and get out. After the owl, we go to Mary. Uh, Mary's in a tough spot. She's about to get magic missiled, and I don't see any way for her to avoid it. So... Mary could skip her turn. Mary could skip her turn. That's an excellent idea. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> perhaps won't do that, but I'm about to eat 14 magic missiles. From a 10 plus evoker. The minimum of that <laughs> is lethal, so... Oh, you know what I can do? I can go to a spot that the evoker can't see. She's going to teleport next to the road. Smart move. Hi, buddy. Yeah, that'll do that. That's an entire action, though, so I don't think it's going to much matter. After that, we go to the fighter. Fly back across to Mary's north side. Let's beat the Tara out of Mary. Goodness, that's terrible. Okay, first throw is a miss, even with advantage. Second throw, that is a crit for 22 damage. It hurts, but, you know... Here we are. Third attack. That is a 23 to hit. She will use her reaction to try to block that. Only gets it up to a 23, though. And that'll put us at 12 damage. And that is it for me. After the fighter, we go to the wizard. Wizard, that will drop both of your spells. So you've cast them, but you're unable to release them. Still gonna step out. Let's go some third levels. All magic missiles. Your dice is two. <laughs> 2 plus 1 is 3, plus 5 is 8 times 5 is 40. That's going to be 40 points of damage, which will drop the snake demon. And that's the end of the first encounter. Report hit points. 131 of 202. 122 out of 122. 170 out of 170. 169 out of 169. Any end of encounter actions. I'm going to pop my second wind real fast. Total 24 HP. The next encounter is more than a minute away, less than 10 minutes away. Fly is still ticking. That's absolutely right. The adventurers have breached the back of the abyssal machine. They're going to make their way up the top deck to see where this thing is headed. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand. 155 out of 202 hit points. Our great axe plus two in hand. We have two indomitables available. 122 out of 122. Full charges, all both once still. Spell slots remaining. Four first, three second, two third, three fourth, one fifth, one eighth. Simulacrum is 50 out of 50 HP. Four first level spells. Three second, three third, three fourth, one fifth. 1-8. 170 HP out of 170. Warhammer and a plus 2 shield. 2 turn undeads. 4 level 1 spells. 2 remaining level 2 spells. 3 level 3 spells. 2 remaining level 4. 2 level 5. No remaining level 6s. 1 level 7 and 1 level 8. 169 out of 169 HP, holding a plus two shortbow using plus one arrows. Seven charges left on the instrument of the bards. Anyone have any spells carrying over from the previous encounter? The rogue has fly. I have fire resistance from a potion. I have a familiar and a simulacrum. 
the effects of aid and heroes feast continue monsters abilities items and numbers this encounter has eight gorilla demons gorilla demons are big and powerful demonic resistances to cold lightning and fire immune to poison line sight up to 30 feet so that might cause some problems for the rogue passive perception of 15 maximum perception of 25 rogue you're gonna have to roll for these in case they make active checks they can cast a couple of different spells they're reckless meaning they can get advantage on their attack rolls and then give you advantage to attack them back multi-attack they have two hands and one mouth to punch and bite you with and there's eight of them and that's gonna help do we know what spells they have they have entangle phantasmal force disguise self and invisibility yeah they don't have like any aoe or anything when there's eight of them they kind of do terrain and effects the upper deck of this engine is quite similar to the lower deck of this engine the yellow area that's the ground it's moving past you should you end your turn in it you will move 10 squares backwards if this puts you underneath the engine you're going to take 10d6 bludgeoning damage the orange areas, they have cannons mounted to the top of the abyssal engine. Cannons absorb truly anything you put inside of them. Should you be placed atop one of them or decide foolishly to stand atop one of them, the abyssal arms will grab out of it, try to load you into the top and fire you out. If that happens, then you will be shot 500 feet away from it, taking 10d6 fire damage and 10d6 bludgeoning damage. To avoid this, it's like a grapple check. It's a DC 17 athletics or acrobatics check to avoid getting loaded into the cannon and then the skulls again are on fire so if you stand atop one of the skulls and you're going to take 66 fire damage after that we're going to go to tactics what do you guys think for tactics in this fight so obviously this is a spirit guardians kind of fight aoe as available i wish we could load them into the cannons but they're easily going to make that athletics check unfortunately i wouldn't be so surprised about that i think if the opportunity presents itself you give it a shot these are bargar i'd have to blow an entire action grappling one move it over there and then it's going to roll like a five and pass that check you don't have to grapple it anything that pushes them into that area so for example if you had a wind fan you could wind fan them in i haven't used that thing in forever right and how did it go <laughs> last time we tried to use it on a Barbara. Just <laughs> trying to figure out what type of AOE to use, if any, but I don't think I've got much options here. Do we want to just sit in this narrow little hole and let them come at us? I don't think they have meaningful, like, ranged options, so it's not like we're going to be subject to a barrage here. These are all low walls. They're not totally encompassing. They could just stand over the top of them and punch down. Or grab us and go load us in a cannon. Then, in that case, we've got to keep them from doing that to some of our people. Do we have any mobility lockdown? Can you do the resistance one more time? Fire, lightning, and cold. Oh, well, there goes cone of cold. <laughs> could try and throw in Tangle. Would have been a great time to have reverse gravity loaded. I mean, I could turn somebody into a giant ape. Because that's what this fight needs, is a ninth ape. You say that like it's a bad thing. I said it sarcastically, but I actually mean it sincerely. I put these eight apes in their place. Apes strong together. Break ape. With bigger ape. I have a lantern revealing in my inventory. Is that something I could just set up on the ground and have it shine out? Yeah, if you just want to set it up on the ground, then you're good. It just won't move with you. What plane are we on? You are on the Prime Material plane at the moment. Banishment time. If you upcast Banishment, it targets multiple targets. Uh-huh. That's why I'm just sitting here. I'm like, ah, oh, I think I just found the answer. <laughs> I've also got a lantern of revealing. If we just drop two of them at the front, we should be able to cover a lot of ground there. So it'll reveal in a 60-foot radius. That's the whole deck. I mean, it's only 30 because we're not really going to get them 30 feet away from each other in practice. 30-foot radius of bright light, and invisible creatures and objects are visible as long as they're within the bright light. Blind Oracle is correct that there is an additional 30 feet of dim light, but that's not necessarily going to help. But yeah, 60-foot diameter does cover pretty much the whole deck. I would say be aware that a thing set down on the ground and not being held is not being attempted, so they might steal it. It's fine. We have so much money. In case let's roll some issues. What if I hold the lantern down with my immovable rod? <laughs> yes! That would do it. Of course, then your immovable rod would be unattended. <laughs> and that's expensive. <laughs> no, same cost. <laughs> exactly the same price. Anybody have higher than a 20? Anyone have between a 20 and a 15? 19. 17 on the wizard. Anyone have between a 15 and a 10? I have a 14 on the gorillas. It would be a 14 for the cleric. Who's got between a 10 and a 5? 7 on the fighter. Ow. Six. Rogue, you're up first to start us off. Bonus action to hide behind the cleric. It's a 33. And then take a shot at the one you are hovering over currently. A 30 to hit. 30 hits. 41 points of damage. That's my turn. After the rogue, we go to the wizard. Banishment level 5, the one north of that, and the one just west of that. Charisma 18. Front north gets a 1 on his charisma save, so he disappears. Blue slot on the magic the gathering wheel. 
gets a zero on his charisma save, and he disappears. Did you seriously screw up the Magic the Gathering wheel? No, this is white, blue, black, red, green. I mean, sure, if you rotate it 90 degrees. He rotated it 90 degrees. It's fine. That's the top of the triangle. Look at how they're all phased. I'm done with you. After that, the other wizard. <laughs> Eighth level banishment? So is that going to be five? For every level above four, so you get one more. Are we going to go for everyone except the one the rogue shot? Yep. Top stairs is going to get a 14. He gets banished. Back stairs. He's going to get a 13. He's banished. Bottom stairs. He gets a three. He's banished. White on the Magic the Gathering star. He gets a seven. West of the two remaining. Gets an 18. Passes. Also holding for a minute. So all we got to do is protect the wizards. After that, I got two gorillas. We have a 40-foot move. This guy's going to run over here. Here's the bite attack. 26 to hit. Does hit. 11 points of piercing damage. DC 10 concentration save. That is exactly 10. Then we're going to grapple him with one of our fists. Athletics or acrobatics at your option. Uh, that is a 23. I got a 17, so that will pass. And then the second fist attack, I'm going to try to grapple you. So that's a 15. I got an 11, so that will not be grappled either. Go over here. We're going to attack with the other one. Here's the bite attack. 12 to hit the... Simulacrum. Miss. 26 to hit with a fist. Will hit with a fist. 12 points of bludgeoning damage. Alright, that is a 14. And then the final fist is an 18. It's a miss because I'm going to shield. And those are my guys. After that, we're going to go to Cleric. Walk up to the closest one. Just hit it with the Warhammer here. 21. 21 hits. Divine Strike here. 15. So I will cast Spiritual Weapon again. 28. 28 hits. 7. After the cleric, we go to the fighter. Curve around the bandit north of me, and then we're going to attack Eastern Pogura. Crit with an 18, reroll the damage die number one. That's still bad. 15 damage. Second attack, that is an 18 to hit for 10 damage. Third attack, that's a whiff. Rolled a two. For a total of 14. That's a miss. All right, then. After the fighter, we go to the owl. I'm going to give the one that's six in damage the rogue advantage and slide back over to the other side. After the owl, we go to the rogue. Let's go ahead and use that advantage on that first shot. Well, there's the crit. Oh, wasted crit. Right. I don't know it's keeping the banishment up. That's true. I do get to throw 18d6 at this problem. Good lord. 79 points of damage. That guy drops. Move, hop the railing, bonus action, hide. You will stealth roll. 25. 25 will do it. Wizard. I knew what I would do, but in this campaign it doesn't work that way, because I would normally run downstairs and just play hide away at this point. Absolutely works. You want to disengage and run? Should have did it before, but I didn't think about it. He gets a 20 to hit you. <sighs> Shield. Dashing to get as far away as I can. After that, we're going to go to the simulacrum. He's going to be the hard one. Oh, he's already reacted, so yes, run. Because yeah, he's the more important one. He's got the most. <laughs> After that is the gorilla demon running out of hit points. We're going to stuff a cleric in a cannon. Cleric, give me a acrobatics or athletics check to avoid the grapple. 20. I got an 8, so that'll pass. Second one. That'll be a 23. I got a 19. That'll pass. No cannon for you. All right, he's just going to bite you then. I got a crit. Fair enough. Take 16 points of piercing damage. That's my gorilla's turn. After the gorilla demon, we go to the cleric. All right, let's wail on him back. Start with the warhammer. hammer. 24. 24 hits. It's going to be 6 bludgeoning and 11 radiant. 17 total. In bonus action, we'll use the spiritual weapon. 26. Hits. For a 9. That'll be it. After that, we go to the fighter. Attack number 1. That is a 16. We'll hit for 14 damage. Attack number 2. That is a 24. We'll hit for 16 damage. Lethal. You can come back now. Report hit points remaining. 169 out of 169 hit points. 154 out of 170. 155 out of 202. 111 on the wizard. Simulacrum is 35 out of 50. This is the first short rest, so are there any pre-rest actions you guys want to take? Do you want to use any hit dice during this short rest? Fighter is using 5 and gaining 47 to max hit points. I am using 2 hit dice, gaining 7 health. Does anyone have any post-rest actions they wish to take? Pearl of Power. Using a Pearl of Power to regain a third. I am doing Arcane Recovery and I am gaining a fifth level slot and a first. So you have eight levels worth of spells to recover. You just told me about six of those levels. No, it's not worth it, unfortunately. So you're not going to do arcane recovery? Yeah. Anyone else have post-rest actions they want to do? I'd like to take the opportunity to pop that potion of heroism right now. Ten more temp HP and bless running constantly. Wizard is recovered and the control compartment of the engine is breached. The adventurers are going to go on there and see where this thing is headed. Hit points, ability, spells, items in hand. Plus two short bow, plus one arrows, 169 of 169 HP. 
122 out of 122 HP, 4 first level slots, 3 second, 3 third, 3 fourth, 1 fifth, 1 eight. full charges on my wand, and my wand of the war mages in my hand. 35 out of 50 hit points, 3 first level, 3 second, 3 third, 3 fourth, 1 fifth. 161 out of 170, I am carrying the warhammer and the plus 2 shield. I have 4 level 1s. One level two, three level three, two level fours, two fives, one seven, and one eight. Two hundred and two of two hundred and two HP with a great axe plus two in hand. Action surge, second wind, and two indomitable still available. Carry over spells and allies. Potion of heroism. Ten more temp HP and bless running constantly. I still have a familiar and a simulacrum. The effects of aid and hero's feast. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This encounter has six gremlin demons back here in the corner. They're sitting upon a throne. They're the ones that are controlling this operation. Guarding them, there are six vulture demons, gremlin demons. These have demonic resistances, cold, fire, lightning, non-magical attacks, immunity to poison, and they can turn invisible. They also have a fear effect. How do you guys feel about fear? Wah, wah, wah. Great. They have a claw attack as well that can do some poison. How do you guys feel about poison? We're very afraid of it. Great. No fear, no poison. No fear, no poison. Heroes feast. Vulture demons are demons, so they have demonic resistances, cold fire and lightning, non-magical attacks, immunity to poison. They have talons and beak attacks. They have a spore attack that can poison people, but you guys are all immune to poison. They also have a stunning screech they can use to stun non-demons in the area. It's a 20-foot radius. After that, we're going to go to the terrain and effects. Much like the previous encounter but a little bit more enclosed the yellow area is the ground moving past you so if you land in it you're going to move downward as the abyssal machine continues past if you for whatever reason land on the treads the treads are a dc 17 acrobatics check or else you fall prone and take 6d6 slashing damage what do you guys think for tactics in this fight all right hear me out lock the door with an immovable rod spirit guardians and force them to walk into us <laughs> the doors slide in and out yeah, sorry. On the one hand, this feels like a Spirit Guardians fight. On the other, those stunning screams are going to be a real pain for anyone who's trying to maintain concentration. Hey, yeah. I think we can just ignore the Quasits, though. They don't do very much meaningful damage, and I don't think they have any abilities that are going to impair us, so just, like, focus down the vultures. Six demon vultures. I do still think that Spirit Guardians should be used. It's just, you know, it's not going to last very long, but still throw it. You could almost do the same strategy here with what we did before. The problem Problem there is the concentration. Either I can burn it another eight to get five of them to try to do five of them again, then have the simulacrum pick up the slack on the last one and then just disappear if they all fail. It's a good option one, and then we can just rely on Spirit Guardians and trying to clear them out as fast as we can afterwards. Yeah, and it's a lot easier for you to beat the concentration check if there's only one of them who's trying to do it. So we're going to go with, try to burn the 8th level slot on these vultures. I hate for that to be the answer every time, but... As an evoker, you're doing a lot of elemental damage, and everything we're going to go up against is resistant to it. So, like, non-damaging spells are your best bet here. You're making good use of it. That's my plan, though. Let's throw down, then. So we'll come down to initiative. Anybody have higher than a 20. Anyone have between a 20 and a 15? 18 for the rogue. 16 for the wizard. 15 for the owl. Anyone have between a 15 and a 10? 13 on the fighter. I have an 8 on the vultures. And what do you got for me, cleric? I got a 2. Rogue, you're up first. This is awkward. Bonus action hide. Doing the math on moving through the cleric here. No, that's, that's way too much. No, 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 I'm sorry. I don't go places where there isn't a fighter standing in front of me. I think the actual answer here is we shoot the vulture demon to the southwest. Well, there's the crit. Can we down the vulture demon in one? Mm, no. I'm going to try. You can certainly try. You're just not going to do it. 70 points. After that is the wizard. I have to be in 60 feet of all of them. So perfect. Vanish. DC 18 charisma, please. Upper left gets a 9. So he is banished. Lower left gets a 15. So he is banished. Central right gets a 12. So he's banished. Lower right gets an 8, so he's banished. Upper right gets a 21, so he is not banished. What else for you? Moving back as far as I can and going to the upper level if need be. <laughs> After the wizard is a simulacrum. He's going to step in, use his final 5th level spell to try to hit both of those vultures. Banish. DC 18 charisma. Upper right is going to get a 16, so he gets banished. Single remaining vulture gets 21. Passes. Same thing, moving back, holding for a minute. Owl. Let's get the fighter advantage. After the owl, we go to the fighter. Dash to the vulture demon, and then action surge for attacks. First attack advantage. Crit. Sure, why not? 20 damage. Second attack. Crit miss. Third attack. Dirty 20 for 16 damage. 16 is lethal. And that's it for me. Cleric, you're up next. Move in front and cast Spiritual Guardian. 
Let's do that at fourth level. Rogue, you're up. This is one of those weird moments where I wish I had one of those weird AoE spells on a scroll. Come steal one from me. <laughs> Pickpocket the friendly wizard. Yeah, there we go. He's got a bunch of fireballs. Do you have fireball on a scroll? That's what I'm saying. Steal one from me. Yeah, okay. We're going to run up, steal a fireball scroll from the wizard, throw it down range. It is a DC 13 dexterity save against 8d6 damage. Not bad. 34 or 17. We got plus 3. We have magic resistance. We need a 10 on 2 dice. We could do this. I also resist fire. You do. If I fail, I take 17. If I pass, I take 8. All of these have 7 hit points. So they all pop. Let me give you your actual damage numbers, though. 8 and pop. 8 and pop. 8 and pop. 8 and pop. He's going to take 17 and drop 8 and pop. Kentucky Fried Quasit. Rogue, I knew you were a wizard. Yeah, it would help if I remembered <laughs> their turn. Oh, well, that's an encounter. Disappointing one as it was. Report hit points. 169 out of 169 hit points with 10 temp HP remaining. 122 out of 122. 35 out of 50. 202 out of 202. That would be 161 out of 170. Any end of encounter actions? Keep holding banish. Stare blankly at each other. I was wondering how long we have between. More than a minute, less than 10 minutes, so your spell keeps going. With no one driving it and the adventurers unclear as to how to steer, the abyssal engine crashes into a river, hits a boat, and the adventurers are going to take the boat across to see what sort of demonic debauchery they can spot on the other side. Hit points, ability, spells, items in hand. Holding plus two short bow, using plus one arrows, instrument of the bards across my back, sneak dice all day. 169 out of 169 hit points with 10 temp HP. 122 out of 122 hit points. Four first level, three second, three third, three fourth, one fifth remaining. Full charges on both wands. Arcane recovery is still up. 35 out of 50 hit points. Three first level remaining, three second, three third, and three fourth. 202 out of 202 HP. Second wind and two indomitables still available. And we have a great axe plus two in hand. 161 out of 170 HP, carrying a Warhammer and a plus 2 shield, 2 channel divinities still remaining, 4 level 1 spells, 1 level 2, 3 level 3, 1 level 4, 2 level 5, 1 level 7, and 1 level 8. Carryover spells and allies. We still have the Potion of Heroism running, which gives me 10 temp HP and bless. I am carrying my Simulacrum and my Fine Familiar. I believe I still have Spirit Guardians, and I have Aid and Hero's Feast still going. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This encounter has three Hezrau and three Shadow Demons. Hezrau are demons, so they have demonic resistances, cold fire, lightning, non-magical weapons, immunity to poison. They also have a stench, a bite attack, and a claw attack. The stench is a 10-foot radius, DC 14, con save versus poison. How do you guys feel about poisoned? They eat it for breakfast. And shadow Demons are demons, so they have demonic resistances of acid fire necrotic and thunder non-magical attacks they're also immune to cold lightning and poison they're also immune to the conditions exhaustion grapple paralysis petrification poison prone and restrained they are however vulnerable to radiant damage which is mighty fine for the cleric incorporeal movements they can move the objects like difficult terrain 30 foot fly speed so they can't make too much out of that this is not a bright light situation so their light sensitivity will not kick in when in dim light or darkness they can hide as a bonus action they have claws that they can use to do some psychic damage as well. What if we were in a bright light situation, say if we had a lantern or two? In a bright light, the demons have disadvantage on attack rolls and perception checks that rely on sight, terrain and effects. As long as you're in the boat, you're not in the water, but otherwise there's a bunch of water on this map. There's also a couple of pieces of difficult terrain where the bushes are and the crystals. The orange section are these strange sort of crystals. Crystals have a mesmerizing energy on them. So if you touch them with your bare skin, as represented by failing a DC 17 acrobatics check if you stand on them, then you will be stunned until the start of your next turn. Is it possible to hide in that if you are a small creature? If you do not get stunned by it, then you can do whatever you want. It's not difficult terrain. You can certainly hide behind them, as long as the enemy is, you know, on the outside of it. It's fine. My minimum roll on acrobatics right now is 25. Which I think brings us to our next section, which is going to be tactics. Any thought about tactics for this fight? We have two lanterns of revealing, so we probably want to have one of those up nearby so that we can prevent those shadows from getting too useful on us. Otherwise, let them come to us. Yeah, I was about to say, I feel like they're probably going to be trying to get to us if we can put up a strong circle of defense here. Keep them within my aura, using the lanterns to deal with the shades. It should just be a matter of handling the larger ones. 
anything we want to go for first, the demons first, or the big guys? Big guys. The demons aren't going to be much use if we put a lantern down. Roger that. That's the case. Let's roll some initiative. Anybody have higher than a 20? Anyone have between a 20 and a 15? 16 for the rogue. Anyone got between a 15 and a 10? I have a 12 for the demons. I have an 11 for the cleric. Anyone have between a 10 and a 5? 9 wizard, 8 owl. 8 fighter. Rogue, kick us off. Sure. Bonus action, hide. Then move into the crystal field and take the shot at the frontmost frog demon. 30 to hit. 30 will connect. 39 points of damage. After the rogue, we go to the Hezrael. This guy's going to move to here. Stay out of the zone. This guy's going to move to there. Walk into the zone. Claire, give me some damage. 22. This will be a DC 18 wisdom save. He's going to pass that and take 11. Then he's going to dash to there. This guy's going to run over to here. The shadow demons... Shadow demons can fly 30 feet. This guy's going to fly to here and stealth as a bonus action. Anyone have a passive perception higher than 19? Nope. This guy's going to fly over to there. Going to get a 24 to hide. He's going to fly to there. Another 19 to hide. That's all my guys. Cleric, you're up. Bonus action. Wait, no, spiritual weapon is a concentration spell, isn't it? Cool. Let's go ahead and cast that. 14. 14 is not going to connect with their natural armor. Move in front of the Hezro, getting off the boat. Action will be to attack the Hezro with the Warhammer. 18. 18 hits. 10 bludgeoning with 7 radiant. 10 points of bludgeoning, it's going to take 5. So that'll be 12 points of damage total. And that'll be my turn. After that, we're going to go to the wizard. I would like to move southwest of the simulacrum then. Big guy's in front of me, he's been attacked, so let's magic missile him, level 3, and I'll roll your dice here in just a second. That, unfortunately, is a 1. 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 5 is 7, 7 times 5 is 35 points of damage. Simulacrum. Simulacrum's going to move to the west the shore here. He's going to do a level 4 magic missile, and that is 4 on the dice. 4 plus 1 is 5. 5 plus 5 is 10. 10 times 6 is 60. It's going to take 60 points of damage and draw. Owl. Owl's going to give that one north for the fighter to get away from there. After the owl, we go to the fighter. Can I object interact to place a lit lantern of revealing here? Yeah. Advance north and do violence. Rolling for first attack, that's a... 16 to hit. 16 connects. 15 damage. Second attack is a crit. Total of 22 damage. Third attack. That's a 16 again for 10 damage. After the fighter, we go to the rogue. We're going to hop in the boat. Whee! We'll take the shot from there at the one with the fighter. This is not an advantage because I'm not hiding, but I will still get sneak because the fighter is in base contact. And there's no disadvantage yet. 30. 30 hits. Yeah. 35 points of damage. Use the rest of the movement to drop down and hide in the boat. After the rogue, we're going to go to the Hezro. Hezro's going to start to turn off in the zone. It's going to be 16 with a DC 18 wisdom save. He's going to fail the wisdom save with a 9. Then he's going to advance. Then he's going to attack the cleric. One bite, two claws. 16 to hit you. Does not hit. Claw number one is an 18. Does not hit as well. Claw number two is a 15. Does not hit. Go up there and go up to the fighter. 12 to bite you, fighter. Nope. Another 12 to punch you. Mm, still nope. 26 to punch you. Hey! 16 points of slashing damage on the claw attack. Shadow demons. Oh, shadow demons. What are you going to do? This guy's going to fly over here at ground level and attack the fighter. Shadow demon's going to claw at you, fighter, for a 14. Nope. Shadow demon's going to fly into the zone. That's going to be 12 with a DC 18 wisdom save. Fails the wisdom save. It's going to double that up to 24. And the shadow demon's going to attack the simulacrum. Disadvantage because it's in bright light of the lantern. He's going to drop a nat 20 in favor of a 16. Fail. And then the other one is going to do the same thing. 13. He's going to fail the wisdom save. 13 is going to bump up to 26. 17 to hit the simulacrum. Fail. 18 to the AC. After that, we're going to go to the cleric. Hit the nearest shadow demon with the warhammer. That's going to miss with a 10. Misses indeed. Spiritual weapons to strike at the Hezro north of me. 24. 24 hits. For 13. After the cleric, we go to the wizard. Let's pick the shadow demon to the west here. Another level 3 magic muscle. Damage is 2 on the dice. 2 plus 1 is 3. 3 plus 5 is 8. 8 times 5 is 40. He takes 40 points of damage. The same thing. Another level 3 from the simulacrum. Another 2. 2 plus 1 is 3. 3 plus 5 is 8. 8 times 5 is 40. 40 points of damage to that shadow demon. Still kicking? Dang! <laughs> Uh, no, he dropped. He dropped. That shadow demon drops. <laughs> After the wizard, we go to the owl. Give the fighter advantage. Leave the one in the middle because he's got damage. After the owl, we go to the fighter. Going after the one I've got advantage on. Let's open with a 27 to hit. 27 hits. 
for 15 damage. Second attack. 16 to hit for 14 damage. Lethal. And I will turn and hit the Hezro to the north of me with the last attack. That's a 20 to hit for 15 damage. And then I will second wind for one, plus my 16 levels is going to put me back at max HP. Rogue, you're up. Get off of my wizard. Stand up from prone <laughs> and shoot the shadow demon. I know where my bread is buttered. Does a 22 hit. Yeah. For 43 points of damage. 43 is lethal. I'm going to pop back down in my boat and hide now. After the rogue, we go to the Hezro. If you provoke me, I'm going to crit you. Walks into the zone. Cleric, <laughs> tell me about it. 22 with a DC 18 wisdom save. He gets a 15 on the save. Attack the cleric. 20 to hit. That will miss. Nat 1 to hit you with a claw. And 19 to hit with another claw. That will also miss. The shadow demon's going to go after the fighter. It has disadvantage because of the bright light. 14 to hit you with the claw. Miss. After the Hezra, we're going to go to the Cleric. Move to the east of the Hezra. Attack the Hezra with the Warhammer. It'll be a... 24. Hits. 8 bludgeoning, 11 radiant. He's going to resist the bludgeoning, so he's going to take 4 from that. Plus 11 is 15. And then for the bonus, I will attack him with the spiritual weapon. But that's going to miss at a 12. You good there? Yes, that'll be it. After the Cleric, we go to the Wizard. Second one, same as the first. Third level magic missile. Your dice is a 3. 3 plus 1 is 4. 4 plus 5 is 9. 9 times 5 is 45 points of damage to the Hezra. Still up. Alright. I think I'm comfortable right where I am. Same thing. Level 3 magic missile. Dice is 2. 2 plus 1 is 3. 3 plus 5 is 8. 8 times 5 is 40. 40 is lethal. Roger that. After that is the Owl. Give the fighter advantage. After the Owl is the fighter. First attack with advantage. 27 to hit. 27 hits. 12 damage. Next one is without advantage. That's a crit for 20 damage. Third attack is a 24 to hit for 19 damage. And then I make silly faces at him and pass my turn. After the fighter, we go to the rogue. Stand up. Am I shooting through cover if I take the shot from there? Yeah, you want to move sideways? Yeah. 28 to hit. 28 hits. For 40 points of damage. 40 points of lethal. Shadow Demon drops. This is the final short rest. Report hit points remaining. Uh, 169 out of 169. At the end of this short rest, my temp HP will expire. 161 out of 170. 122 out of 122. 35 out of 50 for the simulac. 202 out of 202. Does anyone have any actions they wish to take at the beginning of the short rest? Since water's coming up, I definitely want to ritual cast water breathing. Ritual cast water breathing. Sounds good. It's time to spend hit dice. This is also the final one, so it's kind of smoke them if you got them. I spend two hit dice and I heal for nine. I could spend 11 and heal zero. Okay, thanks. Any post rest actions? Arcane recovery. Fifth level gain back and a third level gain back. I'm going to get drunk on my potion of fire giant beer putting my strength at 25 rogue you want another scroll of fireball sure i'll hang on to that <laughs> is somebody gonna collect your lantern i suppose you know now that we've finished our rest i can pick it up the lantern is recovered the spirit guardians drops off the adventurers are going to make their way up the path towards the building that they see in front of them and try to figure out what sort of demonic infestation is radiating out from here hit points ability spells items in hand plus two short bow plus one arrows it's one of the bards on the back 169 out of 169 hit points. 170 out of 170, currently carrying a Warhammer and a plus 2 shield. 210 divinity is left. 4 level 1s, 1 level 2, 2 level 3, 1 level 4, 2 level 5s, and 1 level 7, and 1 level 8. Currently carrying my wand, the War Mage plus 2, and my spell book. 4 level 1s, 3 level 2s, 1 level 3, 3 level 4s, 2 level 5s, 122 out of 122 hit points. 35 out of 50 for the simulacrum. 3 first. Second, one third, two fourths. 202 out of 202 hit points. Great axe plus two in hand. Action surge and second wind and both indomitables available. Carryover spells and allies. I have a potion of fire giant strength active right now. Carrying over a simulacrum, my owl. Aid and hero's feast continues. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This encounter has three crab demons. Crab demons, as you might imagine, I have demonic resistances. They're resistant to cold, fire, and lightning, and non-magical attacks. Immunity to poison, true sight out to 120 feet. They also have innate spell casting, so they have a number of different things they can cast, including fly, confusion, and power word stun. They have multi-attack. They each have two pincers and two fists that they can use to punch with. Terrain and effects. This encounter is an indoor encounter for the most part. I mean, it might wind up going outdoors, we'll see. Most of it is just blocked off terrain. There's a little bit of difficult terrain on that table over there. Otherwise, 
there's a large cauldron in the middle of the room. Should it be touched, land upon, stepped on, etc., will provoke a DC 17 constitution save versus a curse, the type that can be removed with remove curse. This curse will give you disadvantage on every attack roll, saving throw, or ability check you make until you remove the curse. Is the cauldron big enough where it blocks that crab in the back or no? No, the cauldron is set into the floor. It'll provide cover for medium-sized creatures, but not for these large creatures. Okay, so can't do the Benny Hill kite thing. In what fashion do these doors open? These doors swing open. Do the enemies have to squeeze in order to get through that exit? They will have to squeeze. They're large creatures, and these are mostly medium passageways. They'll have to squeeze to get through pretty much any door, any hallway. They're going to do a lot of squeezing if they have to maneuver that much. So what do you guys think for tactics in this fight? Oh, please, let us lock them in there and drop a level 8 Spirit Guardians. <laughs> so we should just block them with people and drop a level 8 Spirit Guardians and just watch the fun. That, or do you want to take two out with Banish, maybe? These guys have got some spells on them. That power word stun can be a little rough. Whatever the caster's think our drop is here, but Banish would also probably be a good time. I've got a fifth, so I can maybe take two, maybe take the other one again. Fourth level on the Simulacrum left. I've got a couple casts as well that I can back that up with. Yeah, I mean, that might be the blitz this encounter that way. Initiative, here we come! Yeah, initiative's actually gonna matter a lot because of whom can open doors. Let's get rolling, though. Anybody have higher than a 20? Anyone have between a 20 and a 15? 18 for the rogue. The cleric has 17. Anyone have between a 15 and a 10? 14 for the wizard, 12 for the owl. Fighter? 6. 4 for the crab demons. Rogue, you're up first. That's a thing that's happening. You want to take my scroll of banishment? No. We want you guys to cast those because when I cast things, my save DC is not as good as yours. Honestly, we're going to take the hide bonus action and then we are going to ready an action to shoot the first enemy I see. Cast fly. You wanted to do it and you have the action. I see where you're going for that, but this is all super indoors. After the rogue is the cleric. I need to have a line of sight for banishment, don't I? Could you imagine? <laughs> I banish literally anyone. Yeah, I think I can get into that doorway and be able to see the northernmost and the westernmost crab demons. The problem you're going to run into is you only have a single object interaction. So you can open one door, but you couldn't open the second one. Open the first door. I wonder if there's a way I can like prep an action to like be able to open the door for someone so they don't have to like... You can object interact as an action. It just takes an action to do it. Ready an action to open the door under what situation? If the wizard wants to cast a spell targeting the crab demons, I'll open the door so that he can fire out. It has to be something you can observe, so I'd imagine him saying, I want you to open the door would be a thing that you could observe. After the cleric, we go to the wizard. Which is not gonna do me much good. We'll move into the room to that spot and dodge, I think it's the simulacrum we're gonna do. Same thing, he's just gonna move in the room and dodge it up for the moment. After the wizard, we go to the owl. Fly in. After the owl is the fighter. I will go ahead and move into the room adjacent to the cleric, ready in action to strike the first enemy that I see. After the fighter, we go to the crab demons. This guy's going to squeeze into there. Reaction for the fighter. Crit for 26 damage. The crab demon is going to cast power word stun. If the creature has 150 hit points or fewer, it is stunned. Otherwise, it has no effect. I cast counterspell 5th level. Go ahead and make the counterspell roll. 12 on the d20. 12 plus 5 is 17. 17 is insufficient to counter this spell. So he's going to hit you with power word stun. Roger that. You can make a constitution save at the end of your turn to end the effect. He spent three to get in there, so he's going to walk back to there. This guy's going to squeeze over to there. Did you have ready action as well? 19 to hit. Yeah, that'll hit. 42 points of damage. He's going to cast power word stun on you, rogue. Do you have less than 150 hit points? No. <laughs> okay, well, look, a rogue with 150 hit points is a lot. I figured you knew that. No, no, I just forgot. This guy's going to move over here and dodge. After that, we're going to go to the rogue. Cool. Stand behind the fighter. Bonus action hide. And then shoot the crab in front of me. I realize I'm damage splitting, but I did not want to be out there alone. Crabs who can't stun you. <laughs> 28 to hit. Yeah, 28 hits. 34 points of damage. After the rogue, we go to the cleric. What's their effective range? Pinchers have a reach of 10. Their fists have a reach of 5. Let's go ahead and cast a level 5 spirit guardians. And then I'll go ahead and enter into the room. Wizard DC 16 con save at the end of your turn. 23. Fifth and simulacrum. Obey your spoken commands, moving and acting in accordance with your wishes and acting on your turn in combat. You save at the end of your turn, so it's not going to do anything because you don't do anything during your turn. It's not one of those telepathic ones. And you have to command it to act. So after the wizard, we go to the owl. The owl, you do command to act on its own initiative. That can be done telepathically. After the owl, we go to the fighter. Advance to the southeast corner, beginning my attack run with advantage. 
29 to hit. Hits. Reroll damage for 13 damage. Attacking two. That's a 26 to hit. Hits. For 12 damage. Attack number three. 16 to hit. 16 to miss. That'll do. After that, we're going to go to the crab demons. This crab demon has his power word, but he can't see anyone. Confusion's not going to be very good. It's a wisdom saving throw. The middle crab demon is going to attack the fighter. 18 to hit your fighter. Nope. Second pincer attack. There's always a second pincer attack. Always a second pincer attack when you're fighting crab demons. 23 to hit. That will hit. It's always the pincer that you're not looking at that gets you. Well, he only did seven points of bludgeoning damage, which is his minimum. I appreciate his gentle nature. He's going to back up with you and bash you into the cauldron. Give me a DC 17 constitution save versus the curse. That's a 28. And then he's going to drag you closer to him. Oh, that's as far as he can go. His friend's going to climb over to here. He's going to throw a confusion at the wizard. Counter spell level four. Fourth level counter spell will dispel the confusion. Cool. Third crab is going to start his turn off in the bubble. 13 with a DC 18 wisdom save. With magic resistance, he's going to get 21 on his wisdom save. So he's going to take six points. He's going to try to shake this cleric to death. Crab hand number one is an 18 to hit you. Does not hit. Crab hand number two, 16 to hit you. Does not hit. Fist to the face, 27 to hit you. That will hit. Take five points of bludgeoning damage. Give me a concentration save. Uh, nine total, still not enough. And so the radius will drop. Final fist to the face is a 20. 20 would not hit. Then he's going to back away, propping an opportunity attack if you want it. Sure, why not? 17? 17 is hit. Four bludgeoning with three radiant. He's going to resist the four damage. That'll go to two. Two plus three is five. Continue his move to there. After that, we're going to go to the rogue. Hide bonus action. 34 to stealth. Advance north two. Take the shot on the crab. Ye old north crab, as it were. 22 to hit. 22 hits. 48 points of damage. Darn near max on everything. Let's go ahead and move straight west. After the rogue, we go to the cleric. Move up to the crab. Cast spiritual weapon between the fighter and the crab. And we can start moving up to the next crab. Then we'll attack with it. 13. 13's a miss. We'll go ahead and attack the crab with my warhammer. 19. 19 hits. Five bludgeoning and three radiant. Total of five damage. After the cleric, we go to the wizard. To northeast of the rogue there. Crab, that's grapple the fighter. Let's banish. DC 18 charisma. He has magic resistance, so he's going to get advantage on this. Only pulls off a 16. Holding for a minute. Let's move back into the room so the rogue can get in and do his thing. Simulacrum's going to banish the one to the east here. DC 18. Can't get any better. He gets a 13. Holding for a minute and just kind of tucking myself in the corner somewhere. Take a seat at the table. It works. Ow. Get in, give that fighter advantage, and he can just stay in the room somewhere up in the air out of the ring. Fighter. I don't have to take the cauldron check again, right? Only if you move into a square, another cauldron square. Well, let's hop off the cauldron and north of the spiritual weapon. First attack with advantage. That's a 31 for 19 damage. 19 is lethal. Well then. And that's the encounter. Report hit points. 169 out of 169 hit points. 20 more than I expected you to have. 165 out of 170. 122 out of 122 and 35 out of 50. 195 out of 202. Any end of encounter actions? I'd like to use a portal power, getting a third level spell back. The adventurers are going to head upstairs, figure out what's going on, what caused this demonic incursion, and see if they can stop it. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand. Holding plus two shortbow, using plus one arrows. Instrument of the bards on my back. 165 out of 170 HP. I'm carrying a warhammer and a plus two shield. Two channel divinity, four level one, two level threes, one level four, one level five, and one level seven and eight. 122 out of 122, all charges remaining on both wands, four fourth level, three second, one third, arcane recovery is used up. 35 out of 35 hit points, three first level slots, three second level slots, one third, one fourth. 195 out of 202 hit points, great axe plus two in hand, we have action surge, second wind, and both indomitables available. Carry over spells and abilities. Aid and Hero's Feast continuing. I have Simulacrum, I have Water Breathing, and Find Familiar. Potion of Fire Giant Strength active. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This encounter has two mercenary demons. These are mercenaries that fight for all sorts of bargains and agreements. They are neutral evil and come from the lower planes. The one to the south is known as an Ultraloth. These are mercenary commanders that will marshal troops. This seems to be the source of the demonic incursion in this area. Kill this and you fix all the problems. This mercenary commander has 
demonic resistances that you've seen before. They resist cold, fire, lightning, non-magical weapons. They're immune to poison and also acid. They're also immune to charm, fright, and poison. They have true sight. They have a passive perception of 17, so rogue, you gotta be on your toes a little bit more than usual. They have innate spell casting of a variety of spells, magic resistance, and their weapons are magical as well. Speaking of weapons, they can teleport, they have a hypnotic gaze, and they have a long sword attack that they can use three times. They are accompanied by a bodyguard, which is a gargoyle mercenary commander, also known as Nykala. The gargoyles have demonic resistances, cold fire lightning, non-magical weapons, immunity to acid and poison, and the poison condition. They have blind sight out to 60 feet, a little more problematic for the rogue, but a passive perception of 14, so that's going to make it a little bit easier. Their innate spell casting is not as impressive, but they still have a couple. They have claws, they have a great axe, and they can also teleport. Terrain and effects. Terrain is rather cramped. You guys have made your way up to the top of this building that they're using as a command post. There is a hole in the center of it that leads down to the same cauldron that you know and love before. It's a 20 foot drop, so 2d6 falling damage should you fall down there. If you fall onto the cauldron, then you might get cursed by the cauldron as before. If there's no questions about terrain, let's talk about tactics for this fight. What do you think? The Ultra Loth is probably the far more dangerous of the two, especially with the Hypnotic Gaze. It's the smaller of the two. Getting there seems like it might be the biggest challenge. Yeah, we've got an enclosed space and a bunch of high-level spell slots, so smoke them if you got them. I don't want to do the banish thing again. It's the answer, but I don't want to do it. So you guys are saying focus fire the southern one? Roger. Well, let's get to it then. Roll some initiative. Anybody have higher than a 20? Rogue has a 21. Anyone have between a 20 and a 15? I got a 19 on the mercenary demons. Anyone have between a 15 and a 10? The cleric has 14. 11 on the owl. 11 on the fighter. What do you got for me, wizard? Oh, I got a big ol' 7. Rogue, you're up first. Who is after me on the initiative order? I am. Okay, we're gonna play this safe. First action's going to be to use the Bandor to cast protection from good and evil on myself, and then I'm going to take the hide action. 25. After that is the mercenaries. The mercenary commander can fly for 60 feet. He's gonna fly over here, he's gonna cast Firestorm. A storm made of sheets of roaring flame appears at a location you choose within range. The area of the storm consists of up to 10 10 foot cubes. You can arrange as you wish. Each creature in the area must make a dexterity save or take 7d10 fire damage half as much on a success. Of all the times to not have fire resistance on. Fighter, cleric, and rogue. DC 17 dexterity save. 18. 12. 18. 42 on a failure, so that's the cleric. 21 on a success, so that's the fighter. Zero on an evasive success, which is the rogue. And then he's going to fly back. Gargoyle mercenary demon. He's going to cast mirror image on himself. After that, we're going to go to the cleric. We're going to go big or go home here. Let's go ahead and cast... Holy Aura at level 8. Divine Light washes out from me and coalesces in soft radius in a 30-foot radius around me. Creatures of my choice shed dim light in a 5-foot radius, have advantage on all saving throws, and other creatures have disadvantage on attack rolls against them. That's a spell. In addition, when a fiend or undead hits an affected creature with a melee attack, the aura flashes with brilliant light. The attacker must make a constitution saving throw or be blinded until the spell ends. Let's go ahead and move into the room. After the cleric is the owl. Just move south of the fighter and fly upwards so he's not in melee range. These guys fly, so he's going to be within melee range no matter what. Okay, never mind then. Yeah, he's fine where he is. Dodge. Fighter. Run me to the spot north of the Ultraloth. We're going to fly across the pit. That way I can get attack of opportunity if the other guy decides to leave. And we're going to dash to get there because we're going to action surge to hit him. Wow, crit for 13 damage. Less than I normally get on a regular attack. Second attack... That is a 23 to hit. 23 hits. For 16 damage. Attack number three. That is a 26 to hit for 16 damage. After the fighter is a wizard. Move to the door way but not in so I can see the guy across the way. I'll fire a magic missile. And I'm burning six charges on the wand. Over channel four. <laughs> it's a free one. Might as well max it. 4 plus 1 is 5, 5 plus 5 is 10, 10 times 8 is 80, he takes 80 points of force damage. Wait a minute, don't want to forget that I have shield. No, I don't have shield. Yeah, that would have sucked. <laughs> you just would counter spell it. Yeah. I think I got one more, right? To the east, please. After the wizard, we go to the rest of the wizard's turn. Same thing, kind of move him up there. Forgot the rogue's in the way. He's good, dodge. After the wizard, we go to the rogue, speaking of in the way. Yep. Very, very in the way. Sorry. 25 foot movement gets me to the edge of the corridor. And we're going to shoot the commander. That is exposing from hiding. Does a 23 hit. Yep. Respectable. 47 points of damage. Lethal. Bam. Did not like Firestorm. Do not want again. Right. Bonus action. Dash. Dash. Let's go to the other side of the cleric. After the rogue, we go to the mercenaries. 
think the only way this lasts more than one round is we throw a darkness upon ourself. And that's an action. After that, we go to Cleric. I would like to cast Dispel Magic on the darkness. Let's go ahead and cast that at level four. Sounds good. Darkness is gone. I'll start moving closer to the gargoyle. After the cleric is the owl. Fighter advantage, please. After the owl, we go to the fighter. Starting with advantage. That is a 31 to hit. Not quite a crit. He gets a six or higher on the first one, so you hit one of the duplicates. Yep. Second attack. 22 to hit. You find the correct target with the second attack. 22 hits him. 20 damage. Third attack. 24 to hit. You find a duplicate. And that's it for me. After the fighter is the wizard. Step out, do a magic missile. Seize up the final level four. That is a two. Two plus one is three. Three plus five is eight. Eight times six is 48. So he takes 48 points of damage. He's good where he is. I'm just going to keep him back here. Simulacrum. He's going to move out. He's going to over channel. His final fourth level slot. Four plus one is five. Plus five is ten. Ten times six is sixty. Sixty points of damage will drop him. And that's the final encounter. You guys loot through the room and you collect a total of... 42,000 gold pieces. These mercenaries were paid quite well for their services. That comes out to 10,500 gold pieces each. You find a staff of healing, bracers of defense, a potion of speed, and an oil of sharpness. What is the recommended distribution on those? I'm curious. So staff goes to cleric, bracers goes to wizard. But imagine speed goes to the rogue and oil goes to the fighter. Of course, it doesn't have to be that. It could be something else. But the next dungeon, the adventurers will level up to level 17 and head off to a red dragon mountain to fight all of the encounters that they can there. The chaos and destruction that these demons would have wrought upon this plane has been stopped. The adventurers are successful. They're going to head back home after this run. By tradition... What was the easiest encounter? They were all pretty easy, I know. Pick a banished one. Pick a banished one, yeah. Unfortunately, it's the answer, like you said. It's the crap tactic, but it's the answer to speeding through this as fast as possible. This is just largely a case of the right tactic for the right fight. This would not be a useful tactic in any Prime Material-based late-game campaign. But against demons on the Prime Material plane, it is an excellent tactic. It's like bringing water breathing to an underwater fight. It's the right answer, but it is the boring answer, unfortunately. All the prep work, 15 levels of getting to this stage, was the important part. Bringing Banish to a Banish fight is the right move. I agree. Blind Oracle? Agree? Disagree? Have other thoughts? Absolutely. I, I, I don't want to say that the rogue is ancillary at this point but this was a caster fight and the whole idea was we're going to banish as much as we can and leverage the fact that we have the right tools on tap in hilarious numbers thanks to simulacrum and high level casters <laughs> ridiculous there's another thing that happens in a banish fight that is i think interesting tactically speaking which is we reverse the normal order of battle normally we are attacking enemy is the defensive presumably we are invading their space but when banish gets popped and we have to maintain that concentration, we are now defending. Our solutions involve running away to other maps, avoiding combat because we're suddenly holding the flag and they're coming for us instead of necessarily, usually, the other way around. So there are some interesting things that happen there where, especially with the simulacrum being so limited in health, he becomes a very important person and we're playing bodyguard rather than adventurer. And that's a different sort of approach. This dungeon was basically, everything had resistance to my elemental side, so it was either magic missile or everything, which we know that works. It always worked at this point. Or banish. Those were my options, really. Like, the, the two true good options. Merrick, agree? Disagree? Other thoughts? This is probably the first time I've ever played at this high of a level, and one of the first times I've played a, a caster at this high of a level. Heading into a demon-specific dungeon as a cleric, I wanted to try and balance using my resources effectively. It was a balance between using the banishment and finding other things to use effectively. I feel like my inexperience in that medium makes probably not the most tactical decisions, and sort of relying on the wizard and the simulacrum to cover a lot of the banishment but they definitely were the right tools for these fights. I just, I was trying to balance using my tools in, as banishment or as, you know, whatever other options I had as a cleric. When I was building this fight, I was like, okay, well, they have banishment. They're probably going to banish it. It's going to be over pretty quick. This one, I was like, well, they got eight guys. You know, they can't banish all of them. It's like, no, but we can banish six of them. Well, could have done all of them, but I was like, mm. <laughs> These have minus one to their save, so they need a 19 to save. That wasn't like, they also don't have magic resistance. That hurt them a lot. I was thinking about throwing 
invisibility on them and then that way they're immune to any spell that says can you see them at least until i can get to the person i want to get to in this fight yeah they have a plus two but they have resistance so they were throwing an advantage so i need a 16 on two dice on five attempts and i was just like i mean i gotta make one of them right twice i couldn't get that one over here you guys didn't throw any banishes you just slogged through it here this is the other one i couldn't believe they have a plus seven to their save they have advantage i needed an 11 on two dice a 75 percent chance and I failed both of them. And then you guys just mopped up the last guy. And it's like we learned with that angel. You know, you miss the ones you don't take. That's certainly true. What was the hardest fight? Was it just the one that you handicapped yourself and didn't throw the banishes in? Snake Demon was at least engaging. Like you said, that one could have been just a banish done, walk away. I'm not sure that that one could. Did that one have a decent charisma save? Snake Demon has a plus 10 and magic resistance. So I would have to fail on a 7 on two dice, which easily done for me. I could easily fail that that was the one where you know sure we've done it in the past where you just throw it and walk away but the odds on that aren't great that was one where we could have tried to just banish it i figured that would probably be because the the tank and spank creature is usually the one with the highest cr and demons often have good charisma saves that was the one where i think actually fighting it out was probably going to be the right call so did that make this one the hardest or is that still the hezros no i think this one was harder the hezros weren't that hard this one was harder this had the potential to go wrong yeah this one definitely that teleport could have screwed us early that shutting the door was a brilliant call i don't think the teleports are very good i mean i think i used it as the best it possibly could be used unless it's a bonus action teleport like misty steps you're like okay i teleport and then i stand there for a round and get beat up i think it's very difficult to use it effectively unless the players really screw up or you have terrain that's just so lopsided of like the fighters taking three turns to run across the map and then you teleport away from him to the other side it's like okay well i lost one turn but i gained two more away from the fighter but here it's just like with two wizards that are just like cool here's 10 magic missiles to the face you're like oh teleport gets you out out of a bad position but it doesn't really get you into a good one yeah i think i was thinking the missy step teleport where it's a bonus so you still could swing but yeah i forgot this one is you teleported and couldn't do anything readying it to do it right before you're about to go is the best way but that's difficult because there's a lot of ways to disrupt it it has to be able to teleport into line of sight so it's like okay it's got to be a spot that it can see it also has to be after an observable event i can't just say okay right before my next turn it's like no you have to find something observable well i'm gonna do it right before the rogue goes let's say the rogue was last i'm gonna do it right after the rogue moves and i was like okay well the rogue just won't move okay well i lost it seems really difficult to fire that properly then i think the nature of being sort of in an enclosed vehicle like this i think it may, in a larger like open field like something with a little bit more like range and variety of like terrain that might work out better but since it kind of was limited to like i can hit a corner there or a different corner here and we were spread around to cover a lot of those bases it didn't really have any places to go it's also a primarily melee attacker which means teleport is sort of never really in its favor i would disagree i think teleport's very helpful for melee attackers to get them into combat i mean only if there's specific obstructions you know it takes the action to get them into the combat zone and then they don't have the action in our context it is somewhat limited in other scenarios you can use it to start off an encounter like the demon teleports into the middle of the party it saw them they didn't see it pre-initiative role it can be very valuable yeah I think the other place that this could have been scarier is if there was more room on this map. Not a lot more, but just a little bit more, and the giant open pit that was going to devour anybody wasn't in the middle. Because then what she could do is just teleport into the middle of us and then use the number of reactions that she's got to punish us for scattering. Even if it takes her turn, bam, Snake Demon teleports into the middle, and now there are, she has, what, eight reactions? one per turn. That means that either she can blank a fighter from hitting more than once realistically at this level, or stab any of the squishies that try to scatter. There were options there. This fighter's not going to move, right? So she's going to use her parry to stop one of the fighter's attacks. Cleric isn't going to move. Other clerics might. This cleric isn't going to move. This cleric's going to cast or spirit guardians. Wizard is probably just going to tank it. I, best case scenario for the wizard, they're just going to tank it magic missile to the face because they don't care about the range. And then the rogue can disengage as a bonus action. Yeah, because in this dungeon, I've got a 23 AC with shield. Some of this is the single monster problem. Snake demons jamming for caster support is just awful. I did write down that I did screw up on this one with the chain lightning. As soon as I said it, I was like, no. And I was like, I should have did the magic missiles. But I was like, but I already called it. Got to stick to it. We talked about this before, but magic missile, it seems like, is always your best. It's the answer at this point. It's just if you can't do something else, it's magic missile, unless it's a big 
a horde of mobs that I can AOE. Tactics in the first one, you guys said burst fire. Obviously you want to burst fire. I guess there's a question of how far down you want to press the gas pedal as you burst this one down. Fighter goes into melee, everyone else ready for the teleport. Fear, I think this was one of your tactics. What did you have in mind for people readying for the teleport? In retrospect, I was expecting something like a teleport in because it's a melee combatant. That gap is difficult to pass without teleporting across. So I figured, you know, something like ready attacks or defenses for when the thing is in among us. But the fact is that, like, it didn't teleport in, it teleported away. At that point, readying does us nothing. We need to just be casting. I have a note here that just says, ironically, because I'm probably the one who suggested the readying, why are we readying actions? Just just cast, just throw stuff. Because it was running. And if it's running, we want to press our advantage. There were a couple of times when we ducked back behind the door and closed the door at the entrance, and it was like, why? Just get in the room and shoot things. I was still thinking this was like the Misty Step teleport until I actually saw it teleport to the road. Because I was thinking it was going to push me off the ledge, basically, type thing. Yeah, I think we lost two spells because we weren't didn't have visibility on it that two were readied spells and that they just fizzled and if you just moved into the room those would have gone off and killed it i I agree with that one yeah that was i had that there too at the very first turn i forgot i had the free object interaction to close the doors to keep it from coming in where we could have moved into the room safely and held the space without having to like hide behind the other set of doors right because it's ready action was to teleport so as you close it it's like all right we could just teleport around this room yeah but i forgot the object interaction any other thoughts about the first one cool map yeah yeah like that's the one thing i do want to say before we get too far down the rabbit hole this as a concept again this works super well amazing concept of a dungeon i'm going on to the second one gorilla demons your tactics here were spirit guardians try to load it might work banish everybody lantern merrick you don't think you did spirit guardians on this one why not a lot of it was not quite understanding the power of spirit guardians really 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 fresh and new for me a lot of it was just timidness i think a lot of my lack of casting is probably due to a lot of timidness not knowing when to cast something or when it is you know most effective to be casting something this is the first time I, i've had to track a large amount of spell slots over the course of this many encounters so i didn't know like is this a good time to be popping that i, I wanted to see kind of how the fight was going to go and then you know six of them get spanished i was trying to gauge okay if we have that money down can i hold off on using some more spell slots in favor of just you know sort of mailing our way through it yeah that makes sense it as a person new to this the resource expenditure is definitely difficult at 16th level the casters are at a point where the limiting factor is not spell slots but turns in combat that can be used to cast spells it's difficult to find this time to throw the spells so it feels like you got to be throwing everything every turn is like here bring up a new spell bring up a new spell bring up a new spell so it's like oh i could have hey sister well that's out now because i need to do this at this point in the fight because somebody's falling or something's in the way something needs to be countered something needs to be dispelled i have a note just said you should probably be casting cantrips over warhammer at this level as a non martial character who doesn't have a second attack action your cantrips scale to your level and your attacks don't so generally if you can if there's not like a reason not to because like these guys resisted your warhammer damage because it's not magical throwing cantrips at least would probably be the go-to and i'm guessing you had a couple of level one spell slots guiding bolts even just to get some damage downfield rather than the warhammer usually i completely agree sort of the hindsight being 2020 here like makes perfect sense to me now i think in the moment the inexperience is the cause of that just not having experience with this kind of character at this kind of level i definitely could see that now it is very quickly a lesson i I will, I will have to learn once. It's something that most people just don't have the opportunity to experience. Merrick, I'm going to defend you a little bit here. It depends on the target. Not these guys. The gorilla demons don't have it, but most of these demons have resistance to magic. In that light, because cantrips are save versus spell, cantrips are not as likely to land. I don't know why this character still has, I mean, another reason nobody bought one, but I don't know why this character still is swinging a mundane hammer. You're throwing 3d8, right? d8 for the hammer, 2d8 for the radiant. The sacred flame is also 3d8, but it has no damage modifier, so it's actually worse to throw that. Now, it has range. That's nice. It ignores cover. Depending on the target, if you're fighting something with low AC but high dex, 
or something that has efficiency and deck saves, or something that has resistance to magic. So Warhammer is probably actually better than the cantrip. Assuming you have a magic Warhammer. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're losing a couple of points of damage, right? But if you're more likely to land, because the cantrip is safer suck, if you're more likely to land with the Warhammer because it's not getting disadvantage, or you have some way of manufacturing advantage on the attack roll, it's more likely to land, which even if you're doing a little bit less damage, is probably better than nothing. However, I don't know how many spells you had at the end of the game, but I'm guessing it's a lot. You should probably be throwing a lot of things like Guiding Bolt or Inflict Wounds first level spells that are now effectively your cantrips. And, and that makes a lot of sense. I was thinking at the end of this one, once the pair of wizards started running off, what I decided to do was fight the people who remained in the time I had left. What I should have done was gone invisible and chased the wizards down. <laughs> Two invisible gorillas crawling through the hallways of this land ship trying to fight after these wizards. The wizards just hear like clattering and banging behind them and like running for their lives trying to maintain concentration on their spells and then just found them and pushed them into an abyssal engine or something. I think that would have been way better but just gotta survive for a minute baby see i was waiting for that too i really was i had stuff for that if you decided to go invisible yeah my note here was that once i did the first banishment i should have started running then instead of staying in the stairwell that was my one critique after you did that there were some very improbable saves on this one these guys should be grapple monsters they're not grapple monsters they have a straight plus four to their strength and that's it. They have no benefits. They have no proficiency with athletics. They look like they're good. They're not. They were trying to do it on wizards. I'm a dex-based wizard. No, I shouldn't have been grappling the wizards. There's no reason to grapple the wizards, other than to stop them from running, but they should have been running in the first turn, so it's kind of moot. I should have been punching them a lot. Dropping them into the thing would have been a very, both cinematic and effective way of breaking their concentration. I mean, cinematic, yes, absolutely. That would have been awesome. Effective, I don't think it would have been effective. It would have been a test versus grapple. If I had the movement left, which I probably didn't, and then they would have a chance to break out and then i would have to put them in there and they get a second test to prevent themselves from getting loaded into the cannon that would be three rolls i would have to succeed on versus the one where it's just like i just punch you in the head and then you fail a save which is two or i punch you again or i punch you a third time you know yeah it's true instead of me having to make multiple successful rolls to get the effect i want to have to make you succeed multiple times to maintain your effect so there's a note for gms there too you know don't fall in love with the gimmicks on your map just sometimes punch the player in the head until they fall out. Yep. Yeah. Moving on to the third one, Vulture Demons. My note says, yeah, uh, that happened. <laughs> In the initiative, I wrote them down as vultures, which is probably why I forgot the closets. I don't know that they would have done anything. Yeah, they're virtual non-entities, as we saw with so little health. I don't remember what they had for casting. The closets cast invisibility and fear. They didn't have anything that could target me in the back. 60% of the regular monster manual doesn't have ranged attacks. Yeah, I could remember they had the cantrips, like firebolt or something like that, but they didn't. There's easy ways for GMs to fix that. You just give them rocks and stones and javelins and, you know, all sorts of stuff. There's a lot of really easy solutions. Not what we're doing because of the very fundamental nature of this game. I think skipping their turn was kind of... Well, it certainly didn't help. A non-bow, I guess, is the word I'm going to use here. They were going to die in the Spirit Guardians, or they were going to die to a single round of Magic Missile. That also would have done it. Or a fireball, as it turns out. I was going to say, how does it feel to be a fireball caster, Rogue? I feel like I have some new magic items to hunt for, if nothing else. Looking at possible things I can grift and just be a backup caster at this point to take some of the weird miscellaneous that you guys should not be burning spell slots on. That's why I carry a bunch of haste scrolls, fly scrolls, dispels. Like at this point, I think one of the things I need to find is a way to cast daylight just so I can knock out darkness rather than burn counter spells or dispel magics on that. Dispel scroll works. A dispel scroll would be better than daylight because it applies in more situations. It's true. You can still, I mean, acquire those from me. Yeah. <laughs> the cinematic moment on the rogue just going yoink fireball is pretty funny like that's that's pretty good what's it say on this sheet <laughs> boom don't mind if i do the vultures wanted to try to taunt you into the room somehow so they can get to the back line and then screech but they don't have any way of taunting you guys inside they have a spore attack which would be great if you weren't immune to poison and if they didn't all get banished hero feast it's fantastic it's absolutely wonderful the fourth one has three hezros and three shadow demons shadow demons every time i fight them they're incredibly disappointing it wants to be a really cool monster but it never is in fairness we walked in with the answer to shadow demons i think tactically this ended up being my favorite encounter 
the one where you got to do something other than watch a bunch of people get banished. Imagine that. Sorry. I think that actually is both the two encounters where banished didn't prominently feature were the most fun encounters. It's a crap tactic, but it's the answer, unfortunately. <laughs> tactic here was lantern revealing. You guys did that very well. I think it did not give you the full benefit of it. I think a couple of times I forgot that it was there. Bunker down. I think that showed that you can really bunker effectively with spirit guardians, even if you don't really have a lot of cover. You guys actually did have a lot of cover with making use of the gems. Yeah, we were in a really good position. Focus on the big guys. I think this was probably the best focused fire you guys had in all of these fights. Granted, it was the only one where we did any damage. The rest of them, they just got banished away. But this one, I think it worked really well. Here... The tactics were block the doors, spirit guardians, and banish, of course, because why wouldn't you? In hindsight, Merrick, do you think spirit guardians was effective or a good choice in this fight? Or should that spell slot have gone to something else? Using the spirit guardians here was a bit of a, I wouldn't know if it was an overcorrection, but it was like, I have been told I should be casting it. I'm going to try to keep casting it. I think my biggest concern was, should I have banished or not? And I feel like hindsight being what it is, it would have been much harder for me to banish. So I think I kind of like dumb lucked into using spirit guardians correctly it was just you know, bad luck that i had you know lost concentration on it so merrick didn't see the last session wherein the absolute glory of a level eight spirit guardians is revealed in this close room where they have to squeeze to even get out all you had to do was walk in and start dodging and they would just shrivel up and die if there was ever a map that was made for a high level spirit guardians cast this is it in fairness like you don't really have experience with spirit guardians much less the ridiculous power that it gets when you boost it up to level eight if those banishers hadn't come off dropping that level seven spell slot you had left over on a spirit guardians in here great fun this map has some limited mobility for the players, right? They have to finagle their way through doorways and hallways. The center of it is the perfect place to drop the Spirit Guardian, but the center of it is blocked by the Cauldron. The enemies have ranged abilities. They have Confusion, Power Word Stun, they have Darkness, they have a couple of other abilities, and they have a bunch of hit points. And not great, but decent mobility. How do you discount all of that away to say it was still a good idea for Spirit Guardians? Cleric, what's your constitution save? Plus five. So a little risky for him to just stand on the cauldron and cast. The reason that I, I really like it for Spirit Guardians is more so than most times, we can just plug the holes with bodies. If the fighter can get to the diagonal door and the rogue fly to the exterior door and we just stand in those holes and block them, the cleric can fill the room with Spirit Guardians. The crabs have to retreat almost into the prison cells to avoid being in the radius. Or they have to drag us out of the spots that we're blocking. And the rogue cleric and fighter are all immune to power word stun. Yeah, until they take damage. If we were going to do the let them come to us strategy, definitely like not opening those doors and letting us get in position because we weren't able to do the banish tactic for that reason. It was more than 25 spaces. I had thought that this was going to be more difficult for you guys because of the range potential of the crab demons. They can pop out, shoot, and then pop back. Even if they do have to squeeze to do it, well, if you're making saves, they don't really care about squeezing or not. When I recommended the rogue take that first round fly, I figured he'd like fly out outside of that that eastern doorway and just sit there and pop shots into the room through there and just drop down to floor level in order to hide. I thought about that. I know Saracen. Saracen probably wasn't going to give me that. He might have sent one of the crabs outside after me and I could have just played keep away with the crab. That's a fair trade. I didn't think Saracen would give me that. I guess metagaming the DM a little bit thinking, okay, this isn't going to be a good use of resources because Saracen's not going to give me that. Maybe it was a waste and maybe I should have cast it. There's no harm, I think, next time and just having it up as a player i don't think it's a good idea because if you cast fly on yourself you're vulnerable to your own concentration you cast fly fly out somewhere get a series of bad rolls now you're stuck out in that spot and you have no one to come get you and somebody else has to cast fly on themselves to get to you versus you cast fly on the fighter the exact same thing happens well he's confused and flying around and as soon as the confusion wears off he can come back i think casting it on other people you're building up less of a liability for yourself than getting trapped somewhere else. Maybe. I'll take my chances with that, though. Right? Advantage on wisdom saves, and I'm proficient. The flip side of what you're saying, Saracen, there is I think that if 
you cast it on someone else, the same is true. If the rogue is flying around off in one corner and the wizard loses concentration to a different enemy, the rogue is still just as screwed. He's stuck in a different area. Now, he's, you know, alert and can try and recover. The trapped issue remains the same. Yes and no. In that case of the wizard casting on the rogue, I agree that's sort of more of a problem, right? Like, what is going on with a wizard can't recast it? If the rogue casts it on the wizard, the rogue is one of the most untouchable people here. I hide. Anybody get a 25 perception check to find me. Unless I start doing speculative fire with AOEs, which I can with confusion. It's a lot harder to pick him off. If you use fly as a platform that you shoot from, I think that's problematic because you're going to wind up dropping, you're going to wind up getting stuck in train you don't want to be in. That's kind of what I meant was you can use it to take the shots out of melee range of somebody who's sitting inside that door waiting for you to open it. In that sense, it's not so much the fact that it's fly, it's the fact that it's increased mobility equal to haste or equal to think long strider in other situations. Something that gives you increased mobility so you can button hook better, which is fine. People use fly as a defensive ability and then wind up actually creating a larger vulnerability for themselves in very unlucky situations. Sarson's tactic of casting it on the other person works well for like good and evil also. And haste and things like that. It's awesome. Where uh, two clerics cast it on each other, paladin, burst vicer, or whatever, whoever can cast it. It's so great. Protects from good and evil, greater invisibility, I believe. Those, I think, you want a certain amount of cross-casting. You have someone casting fly on a, another person, and the initial caster is confused. Depending on where fly put you, you've now actually got two people out of the fight. One is the caster who's confused, the other is the flyer who's stranded. Whereas if the rogue is casting just on himself, if he gets stranded and confused, well, sure, he's out of the fight, but it's only one person. I can see that. The person who's confused is with allies, though, so they have support. Fair, yeah. And the other one is not, unless they've again, put themselves in a situation where they create a liability by dropping, for instance, or something like that. Sixth one was Mercenary Demons. Commander has a bunch of really cool spells, none of which I got to use. I mean, I guess I got to use one of them. He also has Mass Suggestion, which, oh man, I was rubbing my grubby little hands about that one, but I didn't get to a second round with him, so it didn't matter. So we just did Firestorm. Firestorm worked well. It's actually kind of disappointing for damage, though, like seventh level spell or whatever it is. I was never a fan of it. It's really good for the area involved, right? You can targetedly zap seven different people because you get a ton of cubes. I've been shot by it at high level in another game, and there it was really good because we have a much larger party, so it turned into a ton of damage, even when we were spread out. I probably should have taken full damage. I happened to roll like a 16 and boost up to an 18, but like by the numbers, I probably should have gotten to take full damage there too. I just happened to save on a very lucky roll. I was hoping that Holy Aura would have done more, and I think it would have if the fight had gone longer than the few rounds. But I felt like it was a solid protection for everyone just to kind of like, okay, feel free to kind of do what you need to do, and hopefully the, the Holy Aura will sort of cover your bases. Gets to what we were saying earlier about the these high-level fights, is that they can change so darn quick, where you've got a plan, you're like, this is a solid plan, and the, the next round of the next player can just totally wash that whole thing. Avery Wolf, you threw a sixth level magic missile in this one, right? Yep. I think the casters need to coordinate better. High level spells, six, sevens, and eights, have the potential to turn the fights around. That's the thing that wins the fight. So if one of you is like, I'm going to cast Holy Aura, and the other one's like, okay, cool, well, I'm going to throw a massive magic missile. It's like, well, Holy Aura would probably have been a lot more effective in the Hezro fight. There was more times the Hezros were throwing down against you guys versus this one was just like, okay, well, we're going to snipe them. So more coordination. But it's also like, do we need it yet? Do we need it yet? Do we need it yet? And there's like never a point where you're like, well, I need to cast this eighth level spell. You just, you have the resources to do it, so. It is not an unreasonable thing if you have a reasonably good estimation of what your dungeon looks like encounter-wise. And we have an extremely good estimation of what our encounters look like in this setting. To simply have a plan for the tank and spank fight, I want to drop a fifth and a fourth level spell as my high level spell drops. And just have a plan for like which ones you want to use to make sure that by the end of the night, you really squeeze all the juice out of that orange. As the dungeon goes on and you find you, oh, I overused in the previous encounter, I'll dial it a little bit back on this one. But like, we all know how many encounters we're going to have. You can say, oh, two encounters left, and I've got six high-level spells, I'm dropping three per encounter. And just decide what the best use of each of those spell slots is. I think also, when you get in there, you don't know how the luck of the rolls are going to be, because stuff could go sideways real quick, and you're like having to be like, ooh, that's, I need to save those now, or I need to burn more than I thought type thing. Pre-gaming's good, don't get me wrong. Not saying it's not. 100% agree with you there. Generally, we find we burn fewer spells than we could have. 
as you get, get higher up in levels, challenge rating system that I'm using falls apart more than it previously had. It's just the fact that you have more spells and you're going to use the most effective ones. Like Magic Missile, I was actually thinking it's like Evoker Wizard has the most diverse selection of castings. It has the most utility. But why? Because it has a first level spell that it uses at every level. It's like, oh, you need to do damage? Okay, here's third level damage. Oh, here's my best fourth level damage. Oh, here's my fifth level damage. But you don't have to pick any spells for any of those. You just mem whatever you want at levels two through eight and then keep Magic Missile at the first one and just upcast it whenever you need it. I will say that if you are not using the Crawford ruling, if you make the wizard roll for all of the magic missiles instead and split it, that's less good because you're not multiplying the, the int by the number of magic missiles at that point. I mean, it's in the book. It says that. I mean, people will argue it, but it. I mean, it does state you roll once and you dictate where it goes. Sure. No, no, no. I, I, I get you. I get you. We talk about a lot of things as saying this will fluctuate depending upon who's involved and what your DM wants, right? I, I feel like Evoker is in that place. You can be in a situation where your DM may read this differently, have a conversation with them. Yeah, there's a couple of spells that people interpret differently. I game with one GM who just says, don't cast Polymorph. <laughs> That's all there is to it. I don't allow Polymorph at my table. Another one is just like, I don't allow Liam and Tiny Hut in the extent that sometimes spells work differently from GM to GM. Sometimes they don't exist at all. So there's certainly a possibility that GM says, yeah, if you're an Evoker, you can't cast Magic Missile. You get that ability on all of your other spells, just not a Magic Missile. Wizard, why not three Simulacra? Mostly because I don't want to slow us down more. Do you think it would slow you down? I feel like it would bore everybody else, but it would probably speed it up. All four of us step out, magic missile, all the bad guys, <laughs> we walk away. This is the first time I've actually gotten really close to like actually tapping him out completely. So you're saying having too many other spells, it would just be a waste. He's got three first level, three second, and one third. Six spell slots left. It's a lot of damage. A lot of magic missile damage, though. <laughs> it's still a lot of magic missiles. Thought about that. It's like, yeah, no, I could have him cast it too. Now, because he's got an eighth level slot. Goes back to, we've had the discussion before about the animate object thing i think it'll kind of slow it down a little bit just the juggling i think you could also do something like tell your allies like i'm assigning this one to you tell me what you want me to do with it and i'll do it yeah because i could make a fighter or but i mean the answer is another wizard honestly wizards are the correct answer at this level and with the evocation wizard magic missile it's going to do so much damage it auto hits and it's on par with the rogues damage it's better you're throwing 40s. On third level missiles, he was consistently hitting around 40. It's pretty close. But it also auto hits. Requires visibility where yours doesn't necessarily. 120 range. Yours requires somebody in contact. You'd be hidden. You have more defensive capability. So it's like there's a lot of trade-offs there. The answer to magic missile is shield. Yeah. Sort of, because then you just counterspell it. That conversation ends pretty quick. No, I think the answer to magic missile is darkness, uh, which then you guys solve with to spell magic which is smart i fire magic missile into the darkness maps i think you guys like the maps i did i love that level five with the anteroom and narrow corridors like that felt like such a space that we could use level four was also pretty solid for an open field map all of the maps felt really dynamic i was really excited oh hey acrobatics matters in this game which normally it's it's not and all of a sudden I'm like oh i have great acrobatics i'm gonna plant myself in the middle of this very bad thing for other people but not a problem for me and leverage terrain in a new way to my advantage i thought that was really good i don't think it affected your tactical decision making at all but the fact that i got to try it out and see if something new happened i think that was great it did affect my tactical decision making here because i was kind of stuck in between a, literally a rock and a hard place crystals on one side and water on the other i wanted to get Get to simulacrum with the hezros but i couldn't because of you guys bunkered up really well here sixth encounter was possibly the least engaging map kind of just round and while there was a hole in the middle that stops affecting anybody with winged boots the stairs were a real pain in the backside as we saw when people were unable to get past allies because of our short movement speeds and just having people stacked up on the stairs if that were like a double wide stairway no longer an issue at all there's tactics involved in getting through this that's a tactical decision that's a tactical technique that a person can learn and can implement you need to move you got to flow out into the room when you have this which is one of the reasons i kind of like it is forces the players into the room out of cover and who's the person who should be using this right because one person can use this in cover right so it's like okay well i got a cleric who can stand here a rogue who can hide behind him and then the wizard who's going to dance back and forth the fighter who's going to go up into melee that's the tactical decision about that but if the rogue gets greedy and says oh i'm going to stand here and it's like okay well now i can't so i think there's legitimate tactical decisions that need to be made about that i found it frustrating and also the part of 
of the problem there was just like initiative tends to determine uh, that first round. Our marching order was preset when we came in. And so there was like, there's not a whole lot you can do when it's like, well, I'm the first guy in initiative, but there are three people on the stairs in front of me. Sometimes that's how it breaks. I think some of that is the constraint of the format because we don't set marching order. Wizard and the Rogue in the back because it makes sense. Cleric and Fighter up front. If this was a more organic there wasn't a set format to how we experience the encounters we wouldn't experience some of what fear is talking about because he's right we guff that like we, we straight up duff that and accidentally choked on that when we really didn't have to the marching order was established in level three when i set up the rogue too far forward and he got schwacked people complained about that saying in this format the rogue shouldn't be that far forward to start with and for the past 13 levels it's been as close to this order as possible plate in front everything else in back i got i get you there are opportunities that don't exist in this format that will exist in their games where rogues and wizards are scouting. Theme? 10 out of 10. Loved it. Wish it had been on a different plane, but here we are. Would banish again? <laughs> we could probably arbitrarily say this is taking place on another plane and avoid the banish problem. You know, that's not necessarily always going to be the case. You're going to have adventures on the prime material and they're going to involve extra plane or creatures, so banish them. Level 20 is scheduled to be the Blood War, which will take place on a different plane. I mean, I think the last plane we were on was the Elemental Plane. Yeah, there was an Elemental Plane one. You were in Limbo for a little while. I think that's it. Yeah, because uh, I remember asking, could I banish these? Because I was like, are we on the Prime Material? Any other thoughts about Level 16? Looking forward to Level 9 spells. Merrick, thank you for joining us. You're always welcome back. Next encounter is going to be Red Dragon Mountain. So you guys are going to go fight an adult red dragon at the top of Red Dragon Mountain. And we're all going to buy potions. Yes, I will actually put in a shopping list this time because I have new things I want to try and pick up. Or don't. Up to you. The collection plate to get that Warhammer for the cleric. Speaking of which, are we going up to buying rares? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll type all that up. That's all for the encounters of the Demonic Incursion. Next week, we'll continue with level 17 and climbing up a red dragon's mountain. Thank you for stopping by. I'm Sarson Zero, and I hope to see you then.